Good morning. How are y'all doing? A few goods. Great. I hope the rest of you are doing good too and you just didn't hear me. Uh, anyways, we're glad that you're here this morning. Uh, we're glad that you've joined us to worship. And we would love to be able to connect with you. If you're a visitor or a guest this morning, we'd love to do that. And the way that you can do that is take your phone out and text the word welcome to the phone number that just popped up on the screen. It says 318 300 So welcome to that number. You'll get a text back. It'll have a blue link. You'll click it and fill it out. It even has a spot where you can put a prayer request so that we can be praying for you. And um, we would love for you to do that. If you will turn your attention to the baptistry now, we'll be doing some baptism. Good morning, church. We, uh, we got two coming to be baptized this morning. It's David and Kiana Todd. Um, I'll tell you all a little bit of the story. David and Kiana, um, they're neighbors of the church. We've known them four or five years. And um, they started coming back to church a few weeks ago and we're dealing with some conviction god was working in their life and i got the opportunity to meet with david out here in the parking lot after the seven saying service on a wednesday night he had some questions and 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 um we, we just we just walked through scripture together and, and i was able to lead him to jesus and he he went home and he surrendered his life here went home to kiana and um, she was she was a little upset that she wasn't there. They they'd had some conversations and and had wanted to come forward in church, but just fear held them back. And and uh, that night, right out here, when David surrendered his life, he went home, and Kiana was a little upset that she wasn't there to be a part of it. Saturday was uh, the egg hunt and. They came up. David had a big smile on his face. He said, man, it's been a great week. Kiana was a little upset with me when I got home. She said, I can't believe you did it without me. I said, uh, dude, we can fix that. And, and she met with one of our lady counselors here at the church, Miss Karen Alford. And at the egg hunt, she prayed and accepted Christ as her Lord and Savior. And they, they've come this morning to, to make that public to y'all. David, you believe in Christ, Jesus yes. is your Lord and Savior? Yes. As your public profession of faith, it's my honor to baptize you as my brother in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Watch out. Kiana, do you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? I do. As your public profession of faith, it's my honor to baptize you as my sister in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. If y'all would turn your attention to the screens, we've got one more baptism to show you. Thank you. So, Elliot, we're here today because you're making your first testimony. This is your first testimony showing everyone that you've accepted Jesus Christ as your personal savior. And what a decision that is. That's the most important decision that you've ever made or you will ever make in your life is following Christ. So, Elliot, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and savior? Yes. Amen, what a wonderful decision. Well, look, by the, by the authority given to us and because of the decision that you've made accepting Christ as your Savior, as your grandfather first, and then now as my brother in Christ, I want to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Rising to live for him for all eternity. Amen and amen. We're so glad you joined us for worship this morning. Here are 60 seconds around First Baptist Hall. It's time to be the church at our annual serve day. It'll be Saturday, April 27th from 8 to 3. We need as many volunteers as we can get for this event. This is our opportunity to clean up our town and help out the community. For a list of all the volunteer needs and to sign up, scan the QR code in the lobby after service. Join us this week at the Man Up Men's Event, Tuesday, April 16th at 6 p.m. Hosted at the shop on Highway 157. 
three miles north of Highway 80. We'll be eating steaks, worshiping, and Billy Weatherall from Christ Fit Gym will be bringing the word. This event is designed to strengthen men from all walks of life to help you become a better man. This week's midweek meal will be hamburgers. Sign up by Monday if you and your family will be ordering. There are giving boxes located around the sanctuary for you to drop your tithe in or you can give online. As always, you can text EVENTS to 318-300-1981 to receive a digital bulletin. Or you can scan any of the QR codes you see around campus. Now let's stand and worship. He has made alive together 
with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he has taken, taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, tri triumphing over them in it.
thank you for your love for us. We thank you that you are good. We thank you for salvation. Well, we thank you today for the opportunity to celebrate salvation through observing baptism and seeing life change. Father, we thank you for worship and the opportunity to lift high our praises. May 
the songs that we just sang uh, be our declaration today that you are good and we're going to tell people about it. Father, I pray that as we open your word that you'd speak to me and through me, that you'd open our hearts as we address, tackle, um, as we seek you in a passage that can sometimes create some friction in our hearts. Lord, give us open minds, open hearts to hear what your Holy Spirit has to say to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, obviously, I am not Brother Gavin. Um, he is, uh, he's in Greece with several of our church members and uh, has tasked me and Joey and Blake to preach this morning. So I, I'm the last. I'm the last. And, and that's not always an easy thing. Those guys did a great job, and I'm thankful to be able to serve with them. And I just want to ask you one favor. Don't, I mean, I, I want you to go watch their, their sermons uh, because we're all preaching the same passage, but don't compare us. We're, we're different guys. We, we've, we've spent time studying and seeking the Lord. You, if you listen to all three, you probably will hear very similar kinds of things um, as God uh, uh, led us to unpack this, this passage, these four verses that we'll look at today. Um, but they're also unique, and, and it's, uh, it's great to see how God has spoken to each of us and how he's used us uh, in, uh, in, in these sermons and in these services today. I do want to say to you, though, that Colossians 3, where we'll be today, um, verses uh, 18 through 21, um, it's a rough start. Can I just say it like that? Can I just be honest? Uh, the, 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 it, it may even cause some of you, especially those of you who are ladies, to go, wait, wait, hold on. But listen, don't, don't check out. Don't quit listening. Um, what I want you to hear in, in, the, in the, the main focus, the core message that God has led me to today is this. We, we witnessed baptism. We witnessed a husband and a wife getting baptized together. That's quite similar to where Paul is writing now in the book of Colossians. He's saying, hey, something significant has happened in your life spiritually. You've put off the old self. Now it's time to behave differently. You see, in Colossians so far, Paul has communicated the centrality of Christ and helped us to understand that nothing is more important, nothing is more central than the Lord Jesus Christ. He's confronted heresy that was being taught in Colossae and, and, uh, and even, even in the church. He's, he's instructed us to put off the old self and step into a relationship with Christ. He's now moving into a portion of, of Scripture and a portion of this letter where he's teaching really kind of practical things, really kind of teaching how are we to behave as believers. And that's my goal for us today, is not so much to think about roles in a marriage or roles in a family, but what's a family supposed to look like? Family of believers, what's it supposed to look like? Would you agree that family really should look different than the culture around it? The short answer is yes. <laughs> yes, we're called to stand out. We're called to step out. Not, that's not always comfortable. But as we walk through this passage today, I want you to allow the Holy Spirit to speak in your heart and say, number one, am I standing out? If I'm a believer, am I, do I look different than the people around us? If we're believers, does my marriage look different than the marriages in, out in the world? If we have kids, does our family with these kids, do we look different? Do we operate differently than the people around us? And then we'll finally uh, finish it up. It says fathers, but we'll, we'll think through it more as parents. Look with me at these verses, starting in verse 18. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 18. It says, wives, submit to your husbands. All right, I didn't hear any groans, so I think we're all right. I think we should stop and pray right now. <laughs> this is the word of God. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as it is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and don't be bitter toward them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not exasperate your children so that they won't become discouraged. 
I tried my best to come up with, with some clever things here for these four verses. But the way I read it and the more, the more I studied it, I, there's only, I, I just see that we can take those four verses apart and, and, uh, and, and address them specifically. But, but, but the, the thing is, is we're thinking about Christ in our home, Christ in our family. If you were to turn to 1 Corinthians 14, 33, this is what uh, God says in there. He says, God is not a God of disorder but of peace. And here's the deal. God created everything with intentionality and purpose, right? If things are in their proper order, things work together. Amen? Marriage and the family are only examples of those. They're examples of how when working in proper order, these things point to God and point to the order with which he's created them with. So I believe that it's safe to say that family's important to God. Family's important to God. Think about this. If we agree that family is important to God, isn't it interesting then? This one's going to hurt a little bit, but but I'm going to say it. Isn't it interesting then that the people with whom God has placed us in family units are often the people that we're the ugliest to? Often the people that we are the harshest to with our words are the people that God put us in family with. Why? Why is that? Why do, why do we treat each other so inside our family? Maybe it's because we're comfortable with each other. Maybe it's because you know, we, we just feel like in that relationship, inside that home, we can say things and it doesn't really matter because we haven't offended uh, someone else outside our family or those kind of things. Or maybe, just maybe, it's this. Maybe it's because there's some things associated with the old man or lady that we still need to put off. Maybe there's some things that we need to allow the Holy Spirit to address so that we can now behave as a husband, wife, child, or parent in a way that honors what Christ has done for us and in a way that shines the love of Jesus to the world. Well, let's look at these four verses. Verse 18, we'll tackle it first only because it comes first in order and so that we can get it out of the way. Look, at, look with me. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as is fitting to the Lord. This is, if you're a point taker, this is the way I wrote it. Wives, yield. Wives, yield. That word submit has, has a horrible connotation in our culture today. And it creates, it ruffles feathers. It creates uh, anxiety and friction in some people. But here's the truth of this word, as, as all three of us have shared in our sermons. This word is borrowed from the military. And it, it literally means to be under in rank. To be under in rank. I looked up another definition, and it says this. To yield to a superior force or to the authority or will of another person. So that word yield is important. You see, we're, we're, we're under in rank, but it's voluntary. Does that make sense? We're under in rank, but it's voluntary. Paul is not in any way trying to say, wives, submit to your husband because your value is lower. Now, the, in that culture, that would have been true. In that culture, wives were seen as property. They didn't have a voice in the, in the marriage. They didn't have a voice in decisions to be made. or They, they weren't allowed to, 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 to bring up uh, 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 things that were uncomfortable or, or when they were disgruntled or upset. They just had to bottle all those things in because in that culture, they were literally viewed as property. But Paul's saying voluntarily yield to your husband's leadership. One commentary said this uh, in relation to the, the, the borrowing the word from the military. It says, anyone who served in the armed forces knows that rank has to do with order, order and authority, not value or ability. And that's exactly what Paul is saying. Paul is not saying, ladies, you are undervalued. Your value is less than your husband's. In fact, he's saying, I want to elevate your value, but you have to voluntarily yield to his leadership. This instruction to submit is in no way speaking to the value of a wife, but he's elevating her. Remember, this would have been a radical statement that Paul was making. The Colossians, it would have caught their attention, right? Not only the husbands who are now being, being uh, uh, forced to address. He's saying, my wife is, 
elevated to the same position as I am. And the wife's going, "Mm -hmm, he sure did, you know, uh, those kinds of things. Because she was viewed as property. But, but But what does this mean? Well, I, I thought I tried to think through a whole bunch of illustrations and come up with some good preacher stories or, or things like that. But here's here's what I what I came to. Paul's not talking about value or intelligence or anything of that nature. Paul is saying your husband is to lead you, and guys, you're not off the hook. We'll get to you in just a second. Your husband is to lead you. So you need to let him lead. What does it mean then to submit? Here's, I would say to you this. It does not mean, and across the board, he makes all decisions, and, 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 and I don't have anything to share. That's not what that word submit means. It, it does not mean a total surrender of your personality, your intelligence, or your input. That's not what it means. It does not mean participating in any activities or attitudes that are against God's word, or immoral. But it does mean supporting your decision supporting your husband's decisions and his leadership as he follows the Lord. It does mean sharing your thoughts and your perspective to help in decision making. As Blake shared and I'm certain that that Joey would echo that there've been times in my life Times in their lives when, when there was a decision to be made, and as we're working through those decisions and doing our best to come up with those things, I, I, can, I, can, I can't count how many times I've had to say, okay, Lacey, I need your perspective on this to help me make sure I'm thinking through all the pieces, that we're working through all of the pieces of this thing. So yes, your, your input is valuable. Paul is raising your value to, to match that of your husband. He said, it's, this is a partnership, but somebody has to lead. Somebody has to be the one whom the decisions fall to and, 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 and leads out in those decisions. And so part of what it means to submit, watch this, is letting him lead. You see, sometimes, and I don't mean this to be ugly, I say this with all the love in my heart. Sometimes there are ladies that say, you know, I want to have a husband that leads and then she doesn't let him lead, right? Let him lead. Let him make decisions. Let him guide the family as he follows the Lord. Now, because I was a student pastor, I want to take a step back and, and say something that I think is important. Single ladies, teenagers, I need you to hear me carefully. This is very important, and you need to be very intentional about who you date and about who your future husband will be. His looks really aren't that important, okay? As handsome as he is, money is going to get spent, so don't count on a rich guy, right? Romance, not reliable. (laughs) Ladies, listen to me. You start praying for and you find a guy that's following the Lord and somebody that you can respect. Somebody that you can yield to their leadership when you're married. So ladies, yield. Number next, husbands cultivate. Husbands cultivate. Verse 19, it says this. Husbands, love your wives and don't be bitter toward them. Listen, guys, how you treat your wife, how you love your wife has a lot to do with how easy she's going to find it to yield to your leadership. You with me? It's, it, it, it's important to keep those things in mind. You see, I know that when you read verse 18, I mean, we heard one friend, amen it. I know that when you read, wives, submit to your husbands, you immediately want to start pounding your chest and start grunting and making noises like a caveman. But don't fall for that trap. Verse 18 Listen to me, verse 18, in no way, gentlemen, provides an excuse for you to be a tyrant. Verse 18, in no way provides you an excuse to devalue your wife's opinion, intelligence, 
context, perspective, anything. She's a treasure to you, and you are to love her. The instruction here is for husbands to love their wives. But don't mistake it. Paul is not using the word for love that's talking about romance or attraction or all those kinds of things. Instead, he's using a word for love that's defined as a caring love and a deliberate concern for the well-being of your wife. Think of it as magnets. You played with magnets when you were a kid? If you have those magnets turned the right way, they they snap together pretty easily, don't they? And they work together, whether that's holding something together or holding something on the refrigerator or whatever whatever the case is, right? But if you turn those magnets the wrong way, what happens? They're pushed apart. Now listen, as we're talking about marriages, I, those of you that are married in the room, I want you to think about this. How, how can we put our marriages in line with what Christ is teaching in his word so that our marriages can be an example to the world, so that we come together and we're not pushing each other apart? So that when we show up at church and somebody says, hey, how are y'all doing? We don't have to put on the fake smile and say, oh, we're great. I hate him, but we're great. But that we can come together and work together so that this relationship puts Jesus on display. Guys, you can make it a lot easier for your wife to submit to your leadership if you'll step up and lead. Let me give you some, some helpful hints. Now, now, helpful hints. Let me, let me give you this disclaimer. I am in no way setting myself up as the example. Okay, we good? All right, thank you. Guys, here's some things that we can do. Think about these questions. When was the last time you told your wife why you love her? That one hurt me when I thought about that. I thought about, you know, I tell Lacey often that I love you, but it, it maybe has been a minute since I've sat down and looked in her eyes and told her why I love her. What about this one? Do you initiate family Bible reading or prayer time? Are you leading in that way? Do you talk about your own spiritual life and what God's doing in your life? Those are important ways to lead out spiritually in our homes. Here's another question. How often do you invite your wife's input when there's major decisions to be made? Remember, submission has nothing to do with context or intelligence or perspective or any of those things. You need to invite her thoughts into those decisions when when there are things to be to be made. One more, and then I'm going to get off of our toes for just a minute. When was the last time you accompanied your wife to something that she enjoys, even though you are miserable inside? Y'all, y'all know what I'm talking about? I hate shopping. But there are times that it's important that I go and hold all of the things that are being considered to be bought. They've been tried on. And now they're being considered. They may or may not be bought, but I'm going to hold them and be patient as she continues to go through the clearance section. (laughs) When was the last time you accompanied her to do something that she enjoys? Gentlemen, Paul isn't saying be nice or be kind to your wife. Well, those things are important. That's not what he's saying. Instead, when he's talking about continually practicing self-denial, here's what I believe he's trying to say. Treasure your wife. And if I can say it this way, treasure your wife, dot, dot, dot. After all, she said yes. Right? I don't deserve my wife by any stretch of the imagination, and she is indeed a treasure. And I want to, I want to love her in a way that, 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 that helps elevate her position and gives her voice into our marriage relationship and, and, and helps us to come together as those magnets and not push each other apart. But, but he also says don't be bitter toward them. Listen, I'll be the first to tell you that relationships are hard. Relationships are difficult. There's going to be times when your feelings are hurt. There's going to be times when there's friction and you're, you, you don't really know why. There's going to be times when you've just flat out hurt somebody's feelings or said something that you should have said or something has, has hurt you. Relationships are difficult. Even the happiest couples 
have times of disagreement. Even the happiest couples have times of frustration. But what's important is that when those times come, that we address them so that bitterness doesn't set in. You know what happens when bitterness sets in? Then we start ignoring those people we're in relationship with. We stop investing in that relationship and we let, we let things kind of wither up a little bit. As I was studying, I found something or heard something actually as I was listening to someone else share. And um, I, I love it. I love this. And, and I hope it, hope it blesses you as well. The word husband. The word husband really indicates this. One who tills the soil. A farmer. Somebody who cultivates. Men, listen to me. It's our job. It's our role as the husband to cultivate love in that relationship. You've probably heard it a thousand times. Men, don't ever stop dating your wife. Now, listen, that changes, right? It may not be two Johns anymore. It might be walking up and down the aisles of Kroger. I'm just saying, it changes. Those times change, but never stop Stop pursuing the heart of your wife and and, and speaking value into her life. It is our job to cultivate love in our marriage. You find a place where you don't feel loved, well, maybe it's because you're not showing love. You're not cultivating it. I saw saw this quote, and I liked it a lot. It says, a happy man marries the girl he loves. We would agree with that, right? It goes on to say, a happier man loves the girl he marries. You want your marriage to, to shine the light of Christ. Make sure you love your wife. Cultivate that relationship. Help it to grow and help her to grow as a person. All right, so we've talked to husbands. We've talked to wives. We need to talk to the kids. Y'all ready? There should be a whole bunch of amens in this section. I'm just saying, look at verse 20. Verse 20 says, children... By the way, that word children right there, I didn't take Greek and Hebrew, so I have to look them up and, and get other people to help me understand it. The, the word children that, that Paul uses right there is not just talking about the little ones that run around, you know, kicking us in the shin and things like that. Not just the, the word that Paul uses right here is any child who's still living in the home of their parents and, and receiving the benefits of it, Okay. So I could talk a whole lot about what modern culture says about adolescence now. They've extended it into the 30s. It makes no sense, like whatever. But we know that just just because of the world we live in, sometimes kids graduate college and they come back and live in our house and eat our food again um, and all those things. So, So just listen to me when I say this. Paul is saying, if you still live in your parents' house, pay attention. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. In Exodus, children are instructed to honor their parents. I need all the the little teenager and and children eyes to to, to pay attention to me in this section. A big part of honoring your parents is obeying your parents. Okay? Now, I'm going to teach you an easy definition. Easy definition. Ready? This is what it says. This is a definition of obedience. Doing what you're supposed to do, when you're supposed to do it, with a right heart attitude. You ready? I want you to try it with me. I'm going to say it and then you repeat it back to me. Everybody, not just the kids, everybody. Obedience is doing what you're supposed to do, when you're supposed to do it, with a right heart attitude. Thank you. So I've got, Lacey and I have three kids, and, and here's how that plays out, right? There are times when I give them instructions or Lacey gives them instructions, and their job then is to do what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to follow through with what we've told, take the trash out, right? Well, what happens if they say, yes, sir, but then never take the trash out? Disobedient, right? Well, what about when they say, Yes, sir, and then don't take the trash out that day, but take it out the next day. Disobedient. Do what you're supposed to do when you're supposed to do it, right? Well, what about if I say, take the trash out, and I say, oh, my gosh, I can't believe you're out. I have to do everything in this family. What in the world's going on? Disobedient. Do what you're supposed to do when you're supposed to do it 
with a right heart attitude. Children, that's the way you obey your parents and honor them. Now listen to me. Delayed obedience is still disobedience. I need you to hear me say that. Delayed obedience is still disobedience. So saying, yep, I heard you, and then not doing anything is being disobedient. So let's don't be disobedient. But let's ask the question, why should we be obedient? It's a good question. Here's the first thing I would say. Because you're expensive. <laughs> Some recent research, I, I think this might be a little bit low these days, but some recent research says this, raising a kid from infancy to 18, not including college, all right, we're not even going to throw that in the mix, raising a kid from, from infancy to 18, whew, it's going to cost us more than $300,000 from infancy to 18. Y'all are expensive. You want to keep living that way? Be obedient, right? Well, why else? It's very clear. Look back at the scripture. Children, obey your parents in everything. What, what does it say? For this pleases the Lord. Children, listen to me. You want your life to be an example to others? Be, be obedient. Please the Lord in that way. It, it's also foundational. I, I, was, I was studying and, and, and looking at several different sermons that people have preached with this passage and things and I saw this it's foundational to honor our parents to obey and honor our parents and they, this guy used this example and I thought oh that's that's really interesting he said even as he was on the cross and his physical body was dying Jesus our Lord Jesus honored his mother Mary by making sure she had somebody to take care of her mother here's your son son here's your mother it's foundational it's also foundational because God is a God of order. Remember 1 Corinthians 14? God is a God of order. Why has God given us parents? So we can learn things and learn not to do things. It's foundational. You'll do something goofy if you don't learn to listen to us and obey. It's not always going to make sense. Oh, my gosh, my kids have heard that a million times. It's not always going to make sense. And there are going to be times you don't even agree with the instructions I'm giving you. But be obedient. Walk it through. My job as your parent is to honor the Lord as best I can in raising you and to help you to learn to love him and follow him and be productive. Kids and teenagers, I wanted to just address you again because I think this is, I think it's important. I believe that one of the best ways that you can put your Christian life uh, on display as a testimony is to obey your parents. But, but not just your parents. Obey all of those in authority, right? When you're given instruction by someone who's over you in authority, teacher, police officer, babysitter, whatever, parent, one of the greatest things you can do to put your Christian walk on display as a word of testimony is to be obedient and not badmouth them. Why do I say that? Because culture has now just made it perfectly fine for kids and teenagers to, to just to, to, to back talk and say ugly things and, and not be obedient and just run off and do what they want to. That is not honoring to the Lord. And it's damaging to your testimony. So let me give you some ideas, kids and teenagers. Maybe this afternoon, maybe just one of you will go and unload the dishwasher without being asked. Your mom may small fall smooth out. I'm just saying, she may pass right out. Don't be alarmed. She will come to and it's going to be okay. Maybe, maybe this one, maybe this one. Put the phone down and have a face-to-face -face conversation with your parents. Listen to me, they're real people. They have real feelings. They have real struggles. The Lord's doing things in their lives. Be interested in the life of your parent. Put your phone down and have a conversation with them. Or maybe this. This one would be incredible if, if we heard stories of this coming back. Maybe you need to go home and apologize for being incredibly disrespectful. Maybe that's just as simple as that. Here's the deal. Parents are not perfect. Amen, all the parents in the room? Anybody? 
I'm not. We're not perfect. We're going to make mistakes every day, but in most cases, we're doing our very best to raise you to honor the Lord and follow the Lord, and we're doing our very best to provide all the stuff that you could possibly ever want in your life or need or anything like that. We're doing our best. We're real people. We have struggles, but listen to me. Obeying and honoring your parents pleases the Lord. And if you are a Christian, if you're a teenager or a child who's a believer, who's confessed Jesus as Lord and Savior, it should be your desire to obey your parents as a step of obedience to God. All right, we've talked to wives. We've talked to husbands. We've talked to kids. Verse 21 says, Fathers... Do not exasperate your children so that they won't become discouraged. Uh, In studying, I really found out that that could be applied to parents. So we'll kind of think of it in the realm of parents. Uh, Although I think the specific of fathers um, tends to play out here. But here's the thing. Parents, I, I, I want to I twist this just to, just to look at it maybe from a positive, okay? So uh, mothers, uh, excuse me, wives yield Um, Husbands cultivate, children obey. This is fathers encourage or parents encourage. Parents, you've been gifted the opportunity to raise your kids in a way that honors God. In a world, in a society that doesn't make any sense of that. You've been given this opportunity. We don't often look at it like that, right? We look at it when they're babies and we're like, oh, yes, we've been blessed to be their parents. And we do the parent-baby dedication. And all of that is incredibly valuable. But when they start getting big and start getting defiant and start getting big and defiant and all those things, we don't always look at the opportunity to parent them as a blessing. But it is. You've been given the opportunity to parent them in a way that they chase after God, that they they honor the Lord, that they do things differently than all the other people around them. In fact, you know the the, the Deuteronomy 6 mandate for us to love the Lord of God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and to teach our kids to do the same is is the summary. To teach our kids to do the same. You parents, we parents, are given the command to be the primary disciple makers of our children. I hate to inform you of this. That's not the church's job. The church's job, as I understand it in Scripture, is to support you as a parent and to come alongside you to help teach the foundational things of Christianity that, 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 you're, that you're teaching your kids. And we're going to do our very best to do that. But it makes me ask the question, is that even possible? Is it even possible to raise a kid these days to honor and follow the Lord? If you would, um, if you have your Bible, turn back to Daniel chapter 3. I know Brother Gavin preached through this uh, some time ago, but I want to look at it maybe a little different way. I don't even think I was here when he was preaching this passage. But Daniel chapter 3, verses 16 through 18. And I'm going to read them and you follow along. Shadrach... Meshach and Abednego replied to the king. You remember this story, right? Shagrat, Meshach, and Abednego uh, would not bow down when all the instruments played, right? Nebuchadnezzar's mad. He says, hey, bring them to me. These, I want you to get the picture. These guys are standing in front of a king, and they know he's upset, okay? Now, as far as I know, we have no idea the physical stature of Nebuchadnezzar. But when I hear the, the term king, I automatically think of a big guy. So just for the sake of illustration, let's think of Nebuchadnezzar as a big, scary king, right? And he's mad because they didn't follow through with what he said to do. So they know they're standing before a king who's upset with them. But they can also, off to the side, feel the heat from a furnace. And they know the result of the decision that they're about to make. But but it's not not even only that. Those two things are enough. But in addition to that, I just believe there's a crowd around them that's doing their best to be quiet. But you know what happens when a whole lot of people start whispering? It's audible, right? And they're wondering, what are these guys fixing to do? Because the king brought them in. He said, guys, I heard you wouldn't bow down when all the instruments played. I'm going to give you one more shot. And so everybody's waiting in anticipation with what these guys are, are, are about to do. So verse, verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to give you an answer to this question. If, God, if the God we serve exists, then he can rescue us from the furnace of blazing fire, 
and he can rescue us from the power of you, the king. But even if he doesn't, we want you as king to know that we will not serve your gods or worship the gold statue that you set up. Here's what I want to say as we think about this as it relates to parenting. What gave them the resolve to stand in that situation? They're standing in front of a king that they know is mad. They can feel the heat uh, and they know the, 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 the consequences of their decision. They know what's about to happen because he told them what was going to happen. They hear the hushed whispers of all the people around them. Yet somehow, these three boys who were either upper teenagers or not very much beyond teenagers were able to look at the king. And I believe with all due respect, so, King, we recognize your position. We know the consequences of our decision, but we'll not worship anybody but Yahweh. Isn't that what we want our kids to be like? Isn't that how we want our kids to stand? How did they get there? I can only believe that it's because their parents were the ones who were teaching them the stories of, of God, teaching them the stories of Yahweh, and, 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 and telling them how God had taken care of their ancestors in the past and all that God had done in their lives, and teaching them that God promised a Messiah. He's coming. Those parents spoke life into those boys, gave them hope. But I think also that those those parents, those dads in particular, spoke words of affirmation to those boys. Fellas, you, you've got what it takes. You can stand firm. You can, you can do well in the vocation that you've been given. You, 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 can, you are a young man who's chasing after the Lord. I mean, they were taken from their homeland and, and, and made slaves in the, in the service of the king. How did they stand in that? I can only think that, yes, it was, it was by God's uh, strength and glory, but I can only believe that, that their parents speaking words of life into them had something to do with it. That's the way I want my kids to behave. I don't want them to be mad, shaking a bony finger at the, at the culture and saying, you're not going to do this to me, but to stand firm, to find respect in the eyes of the culture but yet to be able to say we're, we're not worshiping anybody except for God. Here's the thing, and I'm, I'm almost done, I promise. Here's the thing. I am by no means suggesting that we don't discipline our kids. I, I, I believe that God's word tells us we need to discipline our kids. Uh, God's word tells us he disciplines those he loves, so why would we not uh, uh, take that as well? We could talk about discipline and that idea a whole other time. Um, but we need to discipline our kids. We have to teach our kids. After all, the, the word discipline sounds a lot like the word disciple. So if we want to raise them up as disciples, we have to teach them, right? We have to be careful that we aren't provoking the anger, just as Paul wrote in Colossians. Listen, we have to be aware that our words aren't too harsh. We have to be, we have to be aware if our expectations are, are absolutely ridiculous, that they'll never be able to reach them. We have to make sure that we're not too demanding or too controlling or, my goodness, if we're unforgiving or if we're just plain mean. If you have a strained relationship with your child, think through how you're treating them, how you're parenting them. I, I illustrate it like this in my own mind. If I kick a dog enough times, they'll quit having anything to do with me. So yes, let's correct behavior when it needs correcting. But let's do it in the way, in the way that honors the Lord. In a way that speaks life into those kids, those boys and girls, those young men, young women. Because here's the thing. You can't do anything... You can't do anything to bring 100% guarantee that your kids are going to follow the Lord. We do everything we can as parents, right? We follow Scripture and we do everything we can and we hold to the promise that if we train them up in the way of the Lord that they won't depart from it. But, we, but they have their own little sinful hearts and minds just like we do. And they're going to make some decisions. So we can't guarantee that. But we certainly can do things that will cause them 
not to follow the Lord. So how do we do that? How do we speak words of encouragement in life? Here's why this is just some simple things I think kids need. In my time in student ministry and being a parent, these are four things that I would say, and, and, and it's going to be real quick. Tell them about Jesus. I think that's first and foremost. Tell them about Jesus. And, and on top of that, they need to know your testimony. Your kids need to know how you came to the Lord. Tell them about Jesus. Be consistent in discipline. If you say you're going to do something, do it. And, and then guess what? Do it again the next time. Be consistent. I, I believe kids and teenagers are looking for the guardrails. That they just need to know where they are. So be consistent. Be fair. Be fair. I know life's not fair, but we can be as fair as we possibly can as we parent and as we discipline. And then number last, avoid comparison. This never happened to me, but I've had some friends that grew up uh, with brothers, and they were constantly compared to each other, and that's not healthy. You see, God created all of us different. We, we're wired differently. We enjoy different things. We do different things. Tell them about Jesus. Be consistent and disciplined. Be fair and avoid comparison. All right, we've walked through four difficult verses. And here's where I'll, I'll land the plane and, and, and be done. My goal in all of this, as I looked at it and, and read around it, tried to get the context, understand what Paul is trying to say in here, I, I just don't believe it's all about roles, about, oh, wives be submissive and husbands love. Blah, blah, blah. I believe it's about saying, the Lord's done something in you. I just taught you about putting off the old self. Now here's how you walk as members of a family and, 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 and people who are married. Here's how you walk in a way that honors the Lord. It's almost as if Paul is saying something spiritually significant has happened to you. Now go and live it out. For some in the room, that may be exciting. Because you've identified all the good things that God's done in your, in your marriage and in your family and you're thankful for those things. And you, 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 right now, you, the emotion that you feel is, I want to go celebrate it. I want to go live it out. It's altogether possible that there's families in the room that that's a struggle at the moment. Marriage is not in good shape. You're having difficulties with a kid. Listen, if I could do anything for you today, I would invite you to, to come with your spouse, come with your family, and spend time in prayer at the altar. There's nothing magical about this place, but there's something significant about stepping out and coming to pray, spend time with the Lord. But you may be here today and you think, I, I can't live that way. I can behave and I can be good, but I can't live that way because I'm, I don't know Jesus. So how, how or why would I even attempt to live a life that's honoring to him? And here's, here's the truth about that. You know, a marriage that's operating correctly, a family that's operating correctly, displays the order that God created things with, but it also puts on display his relationship with us and his relationship with the church. He gave everything. You know, just as he's describing the husband, he gave everything. God looked down and said, I'm going to make a way for this creation that I love to be restored. Now, this isn't exactly the way it happened, but here's the, the picture in my head. At that moment, he turns to his son, Jesus, and says, son, here's the plan. You're going to give up everything in heaven, all the splendor, all the glory, all the, the power and authority that you have here in heaven, and you're going to go live on earth for this reason, to give your life for them. And lo and behold, Jesus says, I'll do it. Because just like you, God, the Father, I love them too, and I want to see them restored. So Jesus came and gave his life while we were still sinners. Guess what? God never said, clean yourself up and then come to me. He said, bring it. Surrender to me, and I will help you deal with all of those things that need to be dealt with. 
All of this, I'll take your sin away and I'll help you work on the habits and the, and the other things that need to be moved out of your life so that you now have put off the old self and like Paul's saying, can step into a relationship with Christ and now a new relationship on earth that puts him on display. Maybe you need to come today to be saved. Or maybe you've decided over several weeks that this is the church you would love to be involved in, that you'd love to plant your family in. We'd love to have you. We'd love to talk with you about that and, and find out how God's working. But as we close, I want to I go back to Colossians and, and really the verse above uh, our passage today, uh, verse number 17. It says this, and whatever you do, and we're thinking about family specifically, marriages and family, and whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Why? Why would we behave in our marriages, submitting to our husbands and loving our wives and cultivating that love? Children, why would we obey our parents? Parents, why would we do our best to raise kids who love and honor the Lord? Because he gave everything for us. He loves us so much that he put those things on display. And he gave his son for us so that we can be made right in relationship with him. So I'm going to close as, we, as we're closing the service. I'm going to invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Our worship team is going to come and play softly for a few moments. But I want to extend that invitation to you, if you need to be saved, listen, there is no better day than to come and take one of our pastors by the hand and just, that's the only words you have to say to them. I, I need to be saved. I need Jesus. And they'll know exactly what to do to help you in that decision. Or if you need to join the church, come and talk with us. We're going to connect you with one of our counselors and talk about what that means and how to do that and the proper steps to take. Or maybe you just need to pray with your spouse, with your family, or maybe by yourself. Come to the altar. Turn your seat into an altar. Don't leave the room without doing what the Lord is prompting you to do in this moment. Pray with me. Father, we thank you for your word that challenges us, that uh, sometimes is uncomfortable. But Lord, as we confront it, you speak to us and you bless us through it. So Lord, I pray that you have spoken to my heart and through my heart. Lord, that words would be transformed to be exactly what people need to hear. Not only the conviction of sin, but the encouragement of living a life that honors you. And now, Father, as we come to a time of decision, Lord, would you give us the boldness to do what you call us to do? To come and speak with somebody, to come and pray. We give you this time. If you'll stand with us. Our pastors are across the front. We're here to receive you and help you in any way that we can. You come. Savior, I come quiet my soul.
Well, listen, thanks for being here. Thanks for coming and uh, worshiping with us, enjoying God's word with us. Uh, if you're a guest, we would love to meet you. Right back this way is guest reception. There'll be several of our staff members back there. We'd love to talk with you and get to know you um, if we possibly can do so. I need to give you three quick announcements um, before we leave. And I'm still ahead of when Brother Gavin turns us loose, so I'm good. Uh, <laughs> Um, I want to remind you, our security officer told me this before the service, but a reminder that 157 South at Alford Road is closed. If you saw yesterday, there was an 18-wheeler that had some issues and is over in the swamp, if you will, um, and they're currently working to get that vehicle out of there, big heavy vehicle. So if you're at 157 South, you might want to find a different way to go um, to the restaurant or home or whatever. But two things you need to know. Um, this Tuesday, man up. Is happening um, at the shop on 157 you saw the announcement there there's gonna be steaks um, listen men I want to encourage you to be here but but also dads I want to encourage you to bring your boys um, it's a great step to help them see authentic manhood is to bring your boys to these events and get them around some godly guys not perfect but godly guys who are doing their best uh, to live out their Christian life in the everyday so man up on Tuesday night at 6 o'clock uh, at the shop on 157. If you need help with that, contact Matt in the office and he'll get you information. And then on the 27th, Saturday the 27th is serve day uh, where we do a whole lot with picking up trash and receiving people's trash and helping to clean up our community. And uh, we need folks to help with that. So uh, you can scan any of the QR codes that you find around campus, or if you stop by the information center uh, out in the, in the lobby, there's some... Uh, cards that you can sign up on and, uh, and drop that right in there. So those are some things coming up and uh, there's more to come, but these are the ways that we want to encourage you to be involved um, here in the next couple days. And again, we thank you for being here. So let me pray one more time and then we will be dismissed. Father, we thank